In today's video we're going to be looking at chemical cells and batteries and this is a chemistry topic but remember it pops up in physics because remember the electrical symbol for a cell looks like this and then if you've got two or more cells together then you have a battery. And the reason we add these to our electrical circuits, so here's my simple circuit containing a light bulb and a cell. Well, it's that cell that provides the push needed to drive the electrons around the circuit, enabling that bulb to light up. So they're incredibly useful and we find them in a whole plethora of things, our mobile phones, the remote controls used to operate the TV. These all contain batteries, but we now need to look at the chemistry which underpins them. So first of all, know that our electrical cells and batteries rely upon the differing reactivity of metals. So remember the reactivity series, we have potassium near the top, calcium sits beneath it in the reactivity series, iron, I'm only picking out a few metals here, but we know that potassium is very reactive and that copper is very unreactive. And the chemistry we use in order to create these batteries relies upon the difference in the reactivities of metals. And you actually find that when you select the two metals you're going to use to make your cell, and what you actually find that when you actually select your metals you're going to use to create your cell or your battery, you want to be picking two metals that differ hugely in terms of their reactivity because they'll generate far more voltage. An overview now of how a simple cell works. Let's look at what we actually need in order to do this. Well, firstly, you need two metals. And as I've already said, they must differ in terms of their reactivities. And you want to dip these metals in a salt solution. And we will look at proper examples. and they have to be joined using a wire. And we often call this wire a salt bridge. Which makes sense because bridges do actually join various parts of the country. Now what actually happens is that the more reactive metal will donate electrons to the less reactive metal. And let's write out that point I was making, which is that the greater the difference in the reactivity between the two metals, the higher the voltage produced by the cell. So please note. And notice if you actually connect this simple cell with a complete electrical circuit, so you basically seal it off with wires, you'll actually generate a current. But that's only if you get a complete electrical circuit, not just a simple beaker with your electrodes and your salt bridge. So let's take a proper example. I'm going to pick copper and zinc. And notice that copper is far less reactive than zinc. In this example, we have copper and zinc, which are used to make two electrodes. And these electrodes are dipped into a salt solution containing copper sulfate. And we know that what actually happens then is that electrons flow through the wire from the zinc to the copper. But we need to look at the actual equations which link this. And I've already pointed out that copper is less reactive than zinc, which is essential. So we're going to have the zinc, and it's solid metal, Reacting with the copper sulfate solution, and notice because zinc is more reactive than copper, you find that a displacement reaction takes place where the zinc effectively steals the sulfate. So actually what you produce on the other side is copper plus zinc sulfate. If we draw our half equations, our ionic equations, to show what is going on, I'm going to split up everything into its various ions. So because copper sulfate is aqueous, I know that we actually have Cu2 plus, plus SO4 2 minus. I'm allowed to separate the ions because it's an aqueous solution. We're producing copper sol solid, which we're not allowed to touch because it's a solid. 
And then again, we've got various ions on the other side where we split up the zinc sulfate. Sit back and have a look and see what is the same on both sides of the equation. Well, that's the sulfate ion, and we call this a spectator ion, so we're allowed to just cross that out and ignore it at this point. Then to form our half equations, we simply take both elements and form two equations out of them. So that means we get zinc producing zinc ions, and we get copper ions becoming copper solid. And then we need to balance them by adding electrons in appropriate places. So let's do the copper first of all. We've got it being 2 plus. We want to stop it being positive. How do we do that? By adding negativity. So we're going to add electrons in this case. I'm adding two of them to balance that 2 plus. With your zinc, we're trying to form positivity. So how do we do that? By taking away electrons. And we need to take away two electrons. Then we need to touch on a couple of definitions we met in the electrolysis part of the specification. Remember, oxidation is loss of electrons. Here, we can see that electrons are being lost, which is why this step is oxidation. Here, the copper ions are gaining electrons, which is why reduction has taken place in the second equation. So if they ask you which species has been reduced, you would write it's the Cu2+. If they ask you which species has been oxidized, you say it's the Zn, and be very specific here. And I've tried to draw you a simple diagram just to show you what's going on. So as I've said, the copper electrode and the zinc electrode are found side by side. They're dipped into the salt solution, which contains copper sulfate. And as I've said here, electrons flow from the wire, from the zinc to the copper. So they flow in this direction. And the electrons flow, make sure you're aware of this, electrons flow from the more reactive metal to the less reactive metal. And in this way, in case they ask you as an exam question, it means that the more reactive metal acts as the negative terminal of the cell. So if we go back to drawing our little cell, this is the negative terminal, that's the positive one. So you find that the more reactive metal, the one that's donating electrons, acts as the negative terminal. And I'll write that out for you too, so you've got it as a note. Let's look at some exam practice now. A student investigated simple cells using the apparatus shown in figure 4. So here we have two electrodes made out of different metals, metal 1 and metal 2, and they're being dipped into a salt solution, which in this case is potassium nitrate. If metal 2 is more reactive than metal 1, then the voltage measured is positive. This is going to be very important. Let's underline that, so it's going to be positive. If metal 1 is more reactive than metal 2, then the voltage measured is negative. The bigger the difference in the reactivity of the two metals, the larger the voltage produced. Remember, this is part of your specification, knowing that the bigger the difference in reactivity, the more voltage you'll produce. Obviously, if the metals are the same reactivity, you won't get any voltage. Anyway, I digress. The student's results are shown in Table 3. So they've taken a variety of different metals and they kept swapping them around. And as you would imagine, when they have the same metal for both metal 1 and 2, such as in the case of chromium, you get a reading which is zero volts, which is what you would expect based on this comment here. The ionic equation for the reaction occurring at the zinc electrode in the simple cell made using copper and zinc electrodes is Zn produces Zn2 plus plus 2 minus. Zinc is oxidized in this reaction. Give a reason why this is oxidation. Actually, all it's really asking here is for your definition of oxidation, which you're going to use oil rig to help you remember. Oxidation is loss of electrons. And actually, if you look at the equation, you can see that zinc has lost electrons. So in this question, you could have just repeated what you've learnt at school, or you could actually just use the equation to tell you the answer. 6.2, look at table 3. Which one of the metals used was the least reactive? And give a reason for your answer. So to answer this question, we need to look back at table 3. If we're looking for the least reactive metal, then we need to find the greatest voltage, as this will be produced between the most and least reactive metals. 
So we can see that the largest voltage is 1.2 volts. And as it's positive, it means that metal 2 is the most reactive and metal 1 is the least reactive. And I've understood that based on these two bullet points here. Our answer to this question is therefore copper. And this is because it gave the most positive voltage when it was metal 1. Six point three. Predict the voltage that would be obtained for a simple cell that has iron as metal one and copper as metal two. Explain your answer, and that's worth three marks. So to predict the voltage that would be obtained from iron and copper, we need to refer back to the table, where we can see that the voltage with chromium and copper is one point two, and the voltage between chromium and iron is zero point five. We know from the reactivity series that copper is less reactive than iron, and therefore our answer is 0 0.5 minus 1.2 and we get minus 0 0.7. I'm going to show my maths here, so I'm doing 0 0.5 minus 1.2 to get minus 0 0.7 volts. So that's my answer, so I've predicted the voltage and now I need to explain my answer for the final two marks. So what did I say? Well I said that the voltage with chromium and copper is 1.2 and the voltage between chromium and iron is 0 0.5 we know that copper is less reactive than iron according to the reactivity series which is why we do 0 0.5 minus 1.2 to get minus 0 0.7.